nothing is as reassuring or beautiful as a parent or grandparent holding a child's hand or putting an arm around them to show care, protection, and security. It's the basic bond of human kindness and deep, deep love. I needed that reassurance when I was four years old. I was playing in the garden of my grandparents' house in Erbil, Kurdistan, when there was a loud thump at the garden door. It wasn't a normal knock, and even I knew because it startled me. My uncle walked out and I ran to him for protection, an instinct telling me to be close to an adult. He put his hands on my shoulders as he opened the door. Two soldiers stood there, stern eyes, no smile, the face of authority. They wanted my mother for questioning and sounded angry. They wanted to know where my father was hiding. He was a poet and a fierce protector of Kurds. One of the soldiers looked down at me and said, is this her child? My uncle was forced to say yes. As the two men took my mother, they gestured to me and said, take her as well. They opened the doors to a vehicle with blacked out windows and immediately, there was a howl and a cry. They had my paternal grandparents. My grandfather was... <laughs> my uncle, mother and grandparents begged them not to take me, but the soldiers ignored all pleas and forced us inside slamming the door shut. I was numb, I wasn't crying, but I knew something was wrong. I stayed quiet. We were taken to a prison where they interrogated my mother and grandparents, but they didn't give in. What's, after what seemed like ages, we were taken to another location, we stopped at a desolate, dry place. There were two buildings. Faces of women and children rushed towards the small windows. It was a prison full of innocent Kurds. Their crime, being Kurdish. My grandfather was separated from us and was taken to one building. I could see he was very scared and later found out he was tortured. My grandmother held my hand as we walked into the other building, women and children back to back. We were there for two weeks until soldiers called out family names and ours was one of them. We were taken outside and there were two buses and two diggers waiting for us to take us to our graves. The adults began wailing, crying, and screaming, shouting, don't do this, please. But the soldiers shook off all pleas and forced us in. My grandfather was already in the bus, and he was crying and not happy to see us. But yet, he opened his arms to hug me. When the doors closed, whispers of prayers and crying were all I could hear. And as we jolted along the uneven road, we didn't know where we were going. We stopped in a location and then continued. Suddenly, we stopped again. But this time, the doors opened and two soldiers stood there. They said, we're Kurdish, don't worry, we're not going to kill you. But you need to disappear and pretend as if you're dead. Don't go back to your homes. Years later, I found out that the drivers changed and they were there to rescue us. What followed was one miracle after another. We went into hiding, dodged mines, bombs, and bullets to reach safety. 
The bombing was so intense sometimes that you'd close your eyes, hold your ears, tense up and just wait to die. And that became our normal. After a year of horrific experiences and underground networks, we were smuggled into Iran. My father followed us, but not as we left him. He was poisoned and on the verge of dying. Another act of the brutal regime. So yes, I am a genocide survivor. I am fortunate. Was it fate? Was it luck? Was it the grace of God? I don't know. But what I do know is what I would have endured if I'd have been on another bus. 30 years later, I saw footage of what Saddam Hussein's soldiers did to Kurds or any families whose names were on the death list. It shows a pit four to five feet deep, full of people lying down, crammed together, all ages. And no, they're not dead, they're all alive. The soldiers can be seen slowly shoveling sand over the live victims who have their hands over their faces trying to protect themselves from the sand that's building up on top of them, knowing they're being buried alive. This is part of the torture. By the edge of the pit is a boy, probably about 10 to 11 years old, He's covering his face with one hand and holding up the other to the soldiers, begging and pleading with them, crying and choking on the sand as he begs. They empty, an they empty another shovel of sand over his face, but still his hand stretches out for mercy, but there is none. I think of him every single day and all I want to do is stretch out my hand and hold his, tell him I care, that I'll protect him, and he is loved. But I can't because I'm here and he's not. When I replay this in my mind, almost daily, I feel a great sense of guilt, loss, and pain for the hundreds of thousands of Kurds that lost their lives to such a brutal regime. But my biggest wish now is not for revenge, but to heal. We need to heal so much that is wrong, but it takes time and courage to reconcile with the past. I've been blessed to experience many people extend their hand to me, and to me, the hand is the most important symbol of peace. With an extended hand, we offer to create friendship, we propose an alternative, we seek truth, we bring hope, reconciliation, and forgiveness. Above all, we give comfort and reassurance. So when someone stretches out their hand to you, just as that boy did, to his tormentors. Take that hand and show you care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let me take those. <laughs> okay. So I guess this panel is. Um, I mean, I've I've been. I was born into a war, and there's still conflict in my region. And um, 
we'd like to know, you know, what steps are needed in terms of, you know, once you've put your guns down and there is ceasefire, does that mean peace? What are the steps? Truth and reconciliation are key pillars um, in the peace process. And this panel will be discussing that. We've got um, Hassan Jallo with us, who you've already seen on stage, and Tuli Mendoncilla. And we've also got Lena Pelesilios. I hope I've said that right. Um, in 2014, Lena co founded the Committee of, for the Rights of Victims of Bohia, which represents 11,000 victims of the Colombian conflict. Lena was fortunate to survive a bombing which killed 119 people, 33 members of his family, including his parents and three brothers. And he is also the winner of the Global Pluralism Award. Uh, can we introduce everyone, give them a round of applause? From my hometown, So my first question is for um, Lena. Hello. Yeah. As, as a survivor and um, losing so many members of your family through the conflict, it, everyone in, it, it's unimaginable and we, we can't comprehend what you've gone through. Um, the, I, I admire your strength and we'd like to know, um, A, what's given you the strength to support others and how important is that for you? Muchas gracias. Primero, un saludo a todos los jóvenes del mundo. Pienso que los jóvenes somos los, la esperanza que tiene el mundo. Y ojalá esa esperanza no se apague por las dificultades. Como lo decía la compañera, yo perdí 32 de mis familiares y pensé que ese día se perdía toda la esperanza. Después me di cuenta, y hablando con las víctimas, de que era posible levantarse de las cenizas y seguir caminando. Y sobre todo seguir caminando porque comprendimos en Bojayá que no nos podían devolver los que habíamos perdido, pero sí teníamos que luchar por seguir sobreviviendo y sobre todo por salvar a los que habíamos quedado vivos. Nosotros perdimos 48 niños, la esperanza de nuestro pueblo. Y de verdad que desde ahí hemos emprendido un camino por la reconciliación. Nosotros queremos que esa reconciliación se dé entre los actores porque pensamos que es la única manera de transformar las realidades. Si 8 millones de colombianos que hemos sufrido la victimización, más de 25 mil desaparecidos, más de 220 mil muertos, esa cantidad de víctimas que hemos dejado, replicamos el dolor y el sufrimiento que han engendrado en nosotros, pues hacemos de Colombia un desastre, el infierno. Y de paso, hacemos del mundo también un infierno. Entonces, por eso nos hemos comprometido con la reconciliación y la paz y consideramos que es la única oportunidad y la realidad para poder seguir viviendo en los territorios. Nosotros vivimos con unas angustias muy fuertes y la verdad sí es que tenemos la necesidad de transformar ese conflicto para que nuestros hijos, nuestros niños sigan disfrutando del planeta. Thank you. My next question is for Thuli and um, Hassan. We, we've heard a lot about the 50-year um, conflict in Colombia. Could you provide a brief insight into um, the conflict in Rwanda and South Africa that led to the peace process, please? We'll start with you. We'll start with you. Thank you. Well, greetings to everyone. Firstly, I would like to congratulate Colombia for hosting this conference and focusing on peace and also to 
congratulate Colombia for choosing the path of peace, which is a difficult path. In South Africa, we had conflict for many years, I think since the time of colonialism, but the most intense time of, pe of conflict was during the apartheid years. After years of trying to negotiate, to try and involve black people in democratic processes, to allow black people to vote and to allow them to own land and things like that, um, black people eventually resorted, or liberation movements, not black people, liberation movements eventually resorted to armed conflict. And this started after the killing of people in a place called Shabbo in, 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 in the 60s. It became clear that there was not going to be a negotiated settlement. Um, and also, just uh, around the same time, leaders such as Nelson Mandela, a, a whole group of them were arrested. That made it impossible for them to negotiate, and then they resorted to armed conflict. And armed conflict took many years. Um, and it was very clear to the leaders of South Africa that it would take hundreds of years to win the struggle through armed conflict. Uh, eventually, sanctions were mobilized as part of the pathways towards democracy, and that created a climate for negotiation. So on the, on the one hand, there was armed struggle. Internally, there was um, protests and other forms of civil, uh, uh, of, 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 of civil um, resistance, and outside there was armed conflict. This created a climate where it was clear to all parties that nobody was going to win. As um, Lao Tzu advises, really nobody wins in war. Everyone has casualties, as we've heard this morning. And those wounds will never heal fully. So the best way eventually is to find a pathway to meeting each other halfway. And the, the truth and reconciliation process started before we had the TRC. During the past eight years, there were years when there were overtures made between the liberation movement and the apartheid government. So you'll hear of some meetings that took place between Nelson Mandela and the, and, and, and the apartheid government. Some meetings took place in, overseas. The role played by young people for me is what is significant here as we meet as young people under one young world. In South Africa, young people from the Africana community met, went to Lusaka to meet with the liberation movement, the ANC, to discuss what is the way forward. And why did they do that? They were being conscripted. They realized that as long as there was injustice somewhere, there couldn't be peace anywhere else. And they, they started these, uh, these discussions. And eventually, everyone then started coming to the party. I was involved at the time when there were now unity talks in Kempton Park. Um, and then later in uh, crafting the National Unity and uh, Reconciliation Act, which became the basis for the, uh, for the TRC. But I'll talk, very, uh, I'll talk a bit now about the TRC process. I just was giving the background to what led to that. Thank you. Thank you. I've got some more questions that, um, yes. to follow, but first let's go to Hassan. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the conflict in Rwanda and what led to the peace process, but also how the community, what role the, the community played in that. Thank you. Um, 1994 uh, was not a good year. It was a bad year, not just for Rwanda, but for the rest of the world. It was what we saw in 1994 in Rwanda was that over a period of 100 days, from April 6, as a matter of fact, um, some up to a million civilians were killed, men, women, and children, in just over 100 days, essentially because they belong to 
the Tutsi minority tribe. Uh, with them also died uh, a number of uh, members of the majority Hutu tribe who had been trying, who had struggled, in fact, to protect the Tutsi minority. The killings, of course, were not uh, sort of so spontaneous. They had their genesis uh, in the policies of an extremist Hutu government which had come into power since 1959 and which periodically had encouraged the killings of Tutsis with impunity. There were no measure, measures taken, uh, measures of accountability taken to bring to book those who are responsible uh, for the killings. So in 1994, uh, this tragedy unfolded there. Uh, over a million, up to a million, as I said, were killed. Um, the result that is that the international community intervened largely with the United Nations leading the way and with the, the, under the leadership of the distinguished Secretary General, Mr. Kofi Annan, who, who is with us here today. Uh, the United Nations then established a, a, an international criminal tribunal to prosecute those uh, leaders or those who played a leading role uh, in, the, in the genocide against the Tutsis uh, in 1994. There had been a rebellion going on at the same time as the genocide was unfolding. Uh, it was largely led by uh, Tutsi exiles, uh, again under the leadership of the current president, Mr. Kagame, uh, exiles who had come in from Uganda uh, to try and depose the, the extremist government. And it was actually these rebels, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which halted the genocide of 1994 and defeated the government, uh, the genocidal government, and, and replaced it. The result, of course, with the establishment of the tribunal in 1994 and the closure of its operations in 2015, it has been that uh, in partnership with the Rwandan uh, legal system, and also with the support of other countries, most of those who played a leading role uh, in the genocide in Rwanda have been brought to account. Uh, they've been prosecuted uh, for their respective roles. And <clears throat> an important finding made by the tribunal, of course, by the International Criminal Tribunal, has been that the killings of these up to a million people was not a spontaneous act. It was an organized act which involved the government leaders, leaders in government at the time. And so you saw the conviction of the incumbent prime minister and members of the cabinet. It involved senior figures of the military. You have the chief of staff of the army who was convicted of genocide and other senior officers. Uh, it involved senior provincial administrators who actually organized things on the ground. It involved members of the ruling political party and their militia who carried out the killings and the rapes uh, on, on the ground. A number of different measures had to be resorted to uh, in order to deal with this situation coming to the second part of your question. When you, do have, when you are trying to deal with uh, post-conflict situations and you intervene, you need a, a sort of cocktail of measures. Truth and reconciliation is, is one part of it you need to establish the truth and use the truth as the basis for your future action. Uh, you need reconciliation, but you need accountability as well. You need accountability. And uh, there are different models of accountability which were resorted. For us at the Rwanda Tribunal, uh, organized by the United Nations, ours was a conventional court, using the conventional trial procedures, etc. Uh, in Rwanda, they used the conventional court system, but they also fell back on their traditions. And so they resurrected what they called the Gachacha court system, a traditional court system, uh, which has among its features the fact that it is very expeditious, it is not expensive, it doesn't involve much legal technicality, uh, but it is concerned at the same time with searching for the truth and effecting reconciliation between the parties uh, in, a, in a process of dialogue. The conventional court system doesn't involve dialogue between the parties. It simply involves a trial. You don't, you don't encourage a dialogue between the parties. But the gachacha system had this unique advantage that it encouraged dialogue between the parties 
and still sought to impose justice uh, for the victims and, and the survivors. Brilliant. Thank you, Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, so going back to... Um, Thank you. I'm going to ask Lena this question. Um, I know personally, you know, anger, hate, and, you know, revenge can be some of the feelings that can come out for victims after experiencing such horrific um, atrocities. How, how, how does truth help victims overcome those feelings? Too late now. Muchas gracias. La verdad es que cuando uno se encuentra y ha sufrido situaciones tan difíciles, pues es nada más normal del ser humano que sienta tanto odio, tanta rabia, tanta venganza. Lo importante es saberla transformar. Nosotros eh, en Bojayá hemos venido emprendiendo un camino de reconciliación y pudimos por primera vez en un momento donde el país estaba totalmente polarizado, Colombia, eh, pudimos por primera vez llegar a La Habana en la mesa de conversaciones y encontrarnos frente a frente con los victimarios y plantearle nuestros anhelos de construcción de paz y con mucho respeto plantearle también la realidad que estábamos viviendo. También Bojayá, después de que recibió la, la pipeta, 15 años después, es capaz de decirle en el marco del referendo al plebiscito, de, le dijo a Colombia que sí quería la paz. Creo que fue una manifestación contundente de todas las comunidades. Fuimos capaces de mandar mensajes de reconciliación, ¿cierto? Porque consideramos que no queremos eh, que Colombia siga padeciendo estos desmanes de la guerra, pero tampoco que en el mundo se sigan presentando este tipo de situaciones. Y yo pienso que cuando se involucran a las víctimas, eh, se involucra a la sociedad civil en, en estos procesos, pues la misma sociedad civil es capaz de dar incluso hasta más de lo que se, lo que se piensa a veces. ¿Cómo es posible que una comunidad sea capaz de reconciliarse frente a un elemento que es irreconciliable, como una masacre como la nuestra? ¿Cómo es posible que seamos capaces de perdonar lo imperdonable, la muerte de nuestros padres, nuestros hijos, nuestros familiares? Pero es posible que cuando esa comunidad se involucra en estos procesos, pues la, eh, el, la misma dinámica va generando caminos y va generando procesos de sanación. Y creo que eh, en ese sentido estamos en Colombia invitados, después de 54 años de guerra, pues precisamente a hacer ese camino de reconciliación, a hacer ese camino de sanación para que estas tragedias no se sigan repitiendo. Nosotros tenemos casos, eh, ahorita habíamos lo de Tumaco, de verdad que a nosotros nos duele y lo repudiamos de manera fuerte frente a eso. Eh, a esta ma madrugada me llamaban de Baudó, diciéndome que eh, habían asesinado los paramilitares a un compañero indígena en una comunidad del Baudó. Todos los días estamos recibiendo noticias de tristeza, y, pero lo importante es que eh, nuestras comunidades siguen con el ánimo pues, de querer que esta realidad que estamos sometidos no se, no se sigan padeciendo. Hoy tenemos y nos sentimos orgullosos y, y estamos muy contentos porque hemos recibido una noticia bonita. El Centro Mundial al Pluralismo Global nos ha premiado por ese trabajo que venimos realizando en favor de la construcción de la paz. Y pienso que esas son acciones también que comprometen a una comunidad mucho más. Thank you. Uh, Tuli, can you describe to us um, how the Amnesty for Truth worked in South Africa and its role in truth and reconciliation? Thank you. The amnesty process in South Africa was part of the pursuit of truth and justice. Often we asked to choose between justice and reconciliation. I've had in the AU, for example, discussions in, in respect of the International Criminal Court that perhaps we have to choose between justice and peace. In South Africa, the decision was that you can't choose between justice and peace. You can have justice and peace at the same time. However, there are different pathways 
to justice and peace. And the amnesty process was one way of achieving justice by ensuring that people provided the truth, they showed remorse, and they helped the families to find the information that would allow them to achieve closure. For example, some people were stolen at night. I mean, when I was a university student, uh, um, people were stolen from university and from various places in the neighboring states, Botswana, Swaziland, Lesotho, etc. And uh, people wouldn't know what happened to them. So the truth and reconciliation process provided them. People would apply for amnesty. For example, there were 5,392 applications for amnesty. Then you would provide the truth. But the TRC had three committees that were operating to verify the process. The one that was involved, one that was critical was the one that was doing human rights violations investigations. Therefore, if you applied for amnesty and promised to provide the truth, but did not provide the truth, the investigation committee would realize that you did not provide the truth because it would have excavated information and brought data and brought witnesses that would help us to determine that you were not telling the truth. If you told the truth, then you would be given amnesty. The family would also be involved. The, the amnesty process would in, involve the, the family itself being part of the process. Then there was an amnesty committee that would determine whether or not you got amnesty. And it, it, it all depended on you telling the truth and showing some remorse. Only 849 of the applicants got the, the amnesty. They were given amnesty. But what was the outcome of that process? Even though the 5,392 applicants did not all get amnesty, that process provided information because you had to choose between going through the normal justice process or go through the TRC process. If you did not go through the normal, if you didn't succeed in the truth and reconciliation process, you could then be prosecuted. In fact, right now we have an inquest that is taking place on, on one of those issues and, and, and information is being provided. I just want to rush to the outcomes. The outcomes was that there was a basis for, tr for peace in South Africa. Instead of people taking revenge directly, uh, families were able to reconcile, and the families themselves were given reparation, even though the reparation was not full. It did not really put them as close as possible to where they would have been, but for what, what went wrong. What didn't happen, though, is that we dealt with gross violations of human rights. We dealt with families that applied for missing persons, but some families didn't apply. Like in my family, there were people, there was my cousin who disappeared during that time. We didn't apply. I was imprisoned for three months. We didn't apply because we looked at only the gross violations of human rights. It's only now that we've started new processes that are consolidating the peace process. And what I would like to say to Colombians, to Afghanistan and other people that are looking at the peace process is set up the framework, set it up in the constitution, involve grassroots, but understand that the process is going to be an ongoing process. The, the Rwanda process, for example, is a good example about involving people. And also let's not understand violations of human rights as being only the gross ones. People who lost their homes were also violated. People were imprisoned. Under my foundation recently, we had a panel on, on June 16, where we did an, a four-generation approach. The, the 1956 activists, the June 16 activists, 80s activists, and now the fees must fall activists. And we asked all of them to tell experiences. We had one woman by the name of Palisa Musa who told her story. She was arrested around 1976 at the age of 13. She didn't go through the truth and reconciliation process. She has been part of what is called Kulumani, where people tell their own stories, but it's a private process. And only now it's being harnessed into the system. But what we learned from that process was that the devastation of war, the devastation of wrong imprisonment, affected people beyond killings. And the reconciliation process needs to take into account that.
and it shouldn't just be a government process, it should also involve civil society because in just that one event, in this intergenerational dialogue, once Balisa told her story, young people, black, white, Indian and colored, had her story and they understood where we came from and where are we and what were the sacrifices. And at that event, they collected an amount to the tune of about 500 US dollars towards beginning to rehabilitate Balisa. And we agreed on something like a Marshall Plan to help rehabilitate families and individuals that have been affected by um, uh, by war. So I would say here, beyond peace, social justice is going to be extremely important so that what was lost, beyond life loss, is also a part of the reparation process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a long list of questions, but we've run out of time. So I think, I think, are we on the exhibition area after this? Uh, yes. We are. Yes. Okay. So I guess we can ask some of the questions there, and then you're welcome and free to ask some questions as well. But I'd like to say a big thank you to our panel. Um, thank you.